Midland is the capital of the Permian oil region. Everything in Midland is about oil and about money. The main tourist attraction is a petroleum museum. In front of the petroleum club in the town, you have this massive display to say, let's make oil great again, MOGA. And it also, uh, the display goes and they say, today is a great day to drill for oil. That's Javier Blas. He's a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, and he reports on the oil industry. For years, Javier has traveled to the region of West Texas that's an epicenter of the shale oil drilling bonanza that has powered the U.S. economy, shaken up global energy markets, and shaped geopolitics for more than a decade. And I was talking to executives and say, well, is it really a great day to drill for oil? Because you are not really nearly as much as used to. Now the beginning of the end is within sight and Wall Street is demanding its share of the bounty before it's over. And that kind of really tailwind that the shale revolution has been for U.S. economy and U.S. politics is not going to be there. I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take, what, if anything, can replace the great American oil boom? Javier, can you start by telling us why the shale revolution in the U.S. turned out to be such a transformative thing? For about 20 years, we thought that U.S. oil production was on a secular decline, that the U.S. was going to produce less and less every year, and that it was going to rely on the international market. And that means really buying more from places like Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and OPEC, more and more. And then when the shale revolution started about 20 years ago, that was really throw away and completely reversed. The U.S. production started to increase. Every year, the U.S. was pumping more oil. When you put oil in total, the U.S. was producing about 8 million barrels a day, and today is producing about 20 million barrels a day. The U.S. went from being energy poor to be so rich that it can export its energy overseas. It was just a once in a several generations transformation. And all of that oil production had an enormous effect, too, on oil prices, both in the U.S. and on the global oil market. Well, I will say that three things happened thanks to the shale revolution. The first one is that oil prices were lower than otherwise. We don't have a counterfactual to say, oh, well, oil prices without shale will have been 20 or 30 or 50 percent higher. But we know that the shale revolution add a lot of supply into the market and that kept prices lower than otherwise. For the U.S. economy, it was also a massive boom. It was a lot of investment going into Texas, New Mexico, Dakota, Oklahoma. It was highly intensive on capital, but also highly intensive on manpower. All of a sudden, unemployment in the oil path went to record lows. It was just full employment. Workers from outside those states were flowing into Texas for jobs. Driving a truck in West Texas was paying $150,000, $170,000 a year. And also, it changed politics. The U.S. all of a sudden have a stronger hand on global geopolitics. The White House, all the way from the 70s, have been always constrained on what it could do against oil countries because it was always fearful that prices will go through the roof. Gasoline prices is a price that every American see every day, and it can't really topple a government or lose an election. All of a sudden, shale changed that, and the White House, for the first time, could go and say to Venezuela, we are going to impose sanctions on you. Say to Russia, we are going to impose sanctions on you. Say to Iran, either you negotiate with us a nuclear deal, or we are going to go and restrict the way that you can export oil. And that have never happened in U.S. politics for at least 30, 40 years. And also in that mix, of course, is Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC-producing nations. The U.S. all of a sudden became a rival to Saudi Arabia and OPEC. It was like the U.S. for the first time has the same force. They were equal in this kind of battle for the control of the oil market. 
to the point that OPEC launched a price war against the shale producers if flood the market in 2014-15, trying to drive prices down to a level that will bankrupt the U.S. shale industry. OPEC refused to yield its production to shale rivals, and the collapse in oil prices is having a ripple effect across global markets. The decision in Vienna sent crude futures to four-year lows and shaved 10% off the price of oil this week. At these levels, some shale producers could lose money. And that was really a realization by OPEC that they have lost control of the market, that they needed to go nuclear. They really went all in to try to regain control of the market, try to ban wrap the industry because this competitor was too strong for OPEC. And that did not work. It didn't work because, yes, a lot of companies went into bankruptcy, prices collapsed, U.S. drilling also fell sharply. But the companies that emerged from that became leaner, fitter, faster. And very soon, OPEC found that shale production was booming again, that the U.S. was exporting oil overseas, and that the market was flooded with oil. And that's the reason that from an average of around $100 for a few years, from 2010 to around 2014, oil prices in the following five years averaged about half of that. For listeners who might not be as familiar with what shale drilling is, can you explain why it was so revolutionary and how it's different from traditional oil drilling? Put it in very simple terms, traditional oil drilling, you drill a vertical pipeline, a hole in the ground, and you go vertical down. And you are aiming to hit a spot that is basically under your feet. What shale formations look like is more like a tiramisu cake. There are many, many layers of productive strata with oil, but they are very compressed and the rock is non-porous. So to reach them, you have to go vertical and then you need to turn around and go horizontal underground for a very long length and then blast the rock with water, sand, and chemicals to fracture that rock and to get the oil flowing. That's what we call fracking. And drilling that way was unthinkable about 30 years ago. Even at the very early days of the shale revolution, the industry as a whole was deeply skeptical that this was going to work. And, you know, we all were skeptical. I remember hearing about this about 15 years ago, and I was thinking, so they're going to drill a hole vertically, and they're going to go horizontal for about 15,000 feet, and they're going to blast it, and they're going to get the oil getting out of the ground, and this is going to work. And I was like, oh, God, that, that is really very difficult. I don't see how this is going to work. Oh, boy, how wrong I was. Many people in the industry were slow to realize the potential, but it was a bunch of maverick oil executives who really tried this first. It was not big oil. This was not Chevron or ExxonMobil. This was a bunch of people in places like North Dakota and West Texas who pioneered this technique. And the thing that made it such a big deal was that just at a time when a lot of people were thinking that the U.S., oil reserves are kind of largely tapped out. They were able to access these pockets of oil that beforehand would have been way too expensive to try to get into. It wouldn't have been worth the cost. You think about the Permian oil, which is this region in West Texas, Southeast New Mexico. Oil companies have been drilling there for about 100 years. Indeed, 2023 marks the 100th anniversary of oil production, what we think commercial oil production in the region. So people were thinking that the reserves were mostly exhausted, that the shale formations were too difficult technically to tap. And these new techniques, as I said, the horizontal drilling combined with the fracking is what really untapped the reserves. The oil was there. The oil was just waiting for someone to find a way to do it. There is a catch here. It is expensive to do. And because of the nature of those reserves, Oil production is a gusher for a few days, and then it comes down very, very quickly. And that was what made shale different, but also very complicated. And if you want another bars of production, you need to drill another well, and another well, and another well. So the oil industry found itself on a bit of a thread mill, and a thread mill that it was just running quite fast. One of the things you write is that after these kind of innovative companies got in there and 
were able to pioneer this new way of drilling, then everybody wanted to get in on it. Shale became the hottest area of the oil industry. It attracted capital from Wall Street back in these pioneers, the early cowboys. But then everyone figured out this is the place to be. So very quickly, Chevron have had properties in the Permian for many, many years, as long as 75 years ago. They never sold the acreage, but they kept the acreage on their books, basically thinking that their value was pretty much zero. And all of a sudden they were like, hold on one second. We own land alongside where these other guys are producing a lot. We can't do that. So big oil kind of figure out, well, let's join the revolution. And that's where Chevron started doing it. ConocoPhillips started doing it. And then ultimately Exxon also arrived there and also joined the shale revolution to the point that you look at what Exxon is doing today. The Permian, West Texas is really where they are drilling the most and they are putting quite a lot of their capital at play. After the break, oil companies set growth aside to focus on making money for shareholders. Javier, before the break, you were talking about one of the drawbacks of this shale revolution was how much money it took to drill these wells. And that started causing a lot of tension between the companies and the investors in those companies. To understand that tension, I went to Midland, Texas. That is a relatively small town, population about 100,000 people. And that's actually where George Bush Sr. settled and created his first oil business before many years later went into politics and finally became the president of the United States. And you can see in Midland, there is a desire to make money from oil. That's the problem there, is the pressure to make profit. The shale revolution was fantastic for the United States as a whole. The economy benefited, but investors lost a lot of money. The companies needed to reinvest so much of their profits to keep up with that thread mill of drilling wells and drilling wells to increase production that at times, very early days, they were putting back into drilling 50% of their profits, that went up to 80%, that went up to 100%, and very soon they were borrowing money because they needed to reinvest 150% of their profits to continue drilling. And for a few years, Wall Street was happy with that. It was similar to the technology industry. You put money early, you take the losses because you want to grow. You are expecting at some point you achieve a critical mass and then you don't need to grow that much and you can start making money. But that never really happened with shale. All the time, the companies needed to reinvest a lot of money and drill more and keep losing money. So at some point, Wall Street said, enough is enough. It was held by the fact that oil prices collapsed during the pandemic and then the industry went into a massive restructuring. Companies abandoned these targets of growing and growing and they focus on returning money to shareholders. And drilling has come down massively in West Texas and across the United States. Prices for oil remain quite high by historical standards. It's still 70 to 75 dollars a barrel. But drilling has come down significantly and is about half of what used to be at the peak of the revolution. You have this striking line in one of the pieces you've written about this, and you called the shale boom the most profitable example of capital destruction the energy industry has ever seen. I say that because I think it was very profitable for the United States as a whole. You think that consumers benefited because they enjoy lower gasoline prices and also lower natural gas prices. The economy as a whole benefited by the increase in investment, capital investment. Shale is a process that requires a lot of money to be spent on everything from chemicals to steel to manpower, etc., etc. And it was also great for the White House and American politics in the terms of giving the U.S. a very strong hand in energy geopolitics. But it was capital destructions in the sense that Wall Street lost a lot of money. About For each dollar that investors put in shale, they recovered only 50 cents. You also write that as Wall Street started demanding profits, that production was no longer going to satisfy them, the industry started to consolidate very rapidly. 
We have seen quite a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and this goes back to the origins of Shell. It was not the big oil companies, it was the smaller companies, it was the Mavericks, a bit of the cowboys. The Shell industry is full of great characters, CEOs who created their companies for nothing and then created these multi-billion dollar oil companies. But that was good for the early days, for a lot of experimentation, for a lot of losses, but for a lot of excitement and growth. When you need to deliver returns, size matters. Consolidation came, companies needed synergies, do more with less money, and we have seen a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the shale path, and also we have seen the big oil companies like ExxonMobil have entered into the shale industry and have bought others to very, very quickly grow. Javier, has that worked? Has the consolidation now given Wall Street what it wants? Are they able to now make money? For the first time, we're beginning to see Wall Street making money from shale. It has helped, obviously, that oil prices were high last year. But we have seen is that companies are no longer reinvesting the majority or even more than what they are making in profits into new production. Now that has come down and companies are aiming to reinvest something between 30, 35 percent, all the way to 50 percent. But the other half of the money that they are making is being sent to shareholders, whether it's dividends or buybacks, special dividends, but Wall Street is getting the money. Obviously, that has a price, and the price is that Shell cannot grow production nearly as fast as it did. Don't get me wrong, Shell production is still growing and probably is going to grow for a few more years, but the rate of growth has slowed down significantly. It is even slower than we will be expected at similar prices. We are beginning to see even a more of a slowdown trend in 2023. That's going to go into 2024. And it was very interesting on my last trip to the Permian was how openly people in the industry that have for many years basically only talk about growth. We're talking for the first time that U.S. oil production is going to peak. There is no agreement when it's going to happen, but everyone now sees this peak looming in the horizon. I think that probably the consensus in the industry is that it's going to happen in the next three to five years, so somewhere between 2026 and 2028. But U.S. oil production that has been growing all the way since 2008 now may peak. And that is a huge change in the industry because also means that unless oil demand stops growing, if the U.S. cannot grow anymore, we have to go somewhere else for oil. And that's going to be where the U.S. was back 30 years ago, into the Saudi Arabia and OPEC hunts. When we come back, why peak shale oil might actually be a problem for the transition to clean energy. You said that if demand for oil in the U.S. keeps growing and production falls, we're going to need to go elsewhere for that oil. But what we're seeing now is a lot of talk about transitioning away from oil, and in fact, some of that actually happening. And you write that the shale revolution bought the world time for that. What do you mean by that? Well, you think about when the revolution started, it is around the time that Tesla was really starting to become the company that we know today. They were not ready to mass market electric vehicles. We didn't have yet the technology on batteries that we have today. Tesla is best known for its $109,000 all-electric roadster. The company apparently wants to take advantage of investor interest in green technology and battery-powered vehicles. Back 15, 20 years ago, we were still completely reliant on internal combustion engines of cars powered by gasoline and diesel. We didn't have really the option that we are beginning to see today that we can move into the electrification of transportation into electric vehicles, whether it's Tesla or any other brand. And if we have not had shale and demand was increasing and the supply was a bit stagnant, what we will have found ourselves and the global economy is with much higher prices, much higher inflation, we will have had an economic problem. So in some ways, shale gave the world economy a bit of time to get ready for a world where at some point shale is not going to be there. We talked a little bit earlier about geopolitics in oil, which is always front and center. 
Certainly with Russia's war in Ukraine, the politics around oil and using oil sort of as a weapon has come up. And so that is still very much a big part of this conversation. It is. And if you think about the sanctions that the G7 imposed on Russia, crippling the ability of the Kremlin to sell his oil, and then the help that the United States provided to Europe, exporting a lot of liquefied natural gas, that would have not been possible without shale. At the same time, there's also the limits of shale. Shale is not a magic pill that solves every energy problem. It helps, but it doesn't really give you the magic solution that is going to make the U.S. energy independent and Europe is not going to have to buy anything from Russia. It is a very large energy system, but it really helps increasing production and therefore giving the system more flexibility. So if you look out into the future, which I know you always do, what do you see? What is your forecast for how this plays out? There are two schools of thoughts, and I'm going to tell you what the two are out there and then where I sit. There is a school of thought that says, well, this is not a problem. Shale grow, slows down, and ultimately peaks in the next five years. But so is oil demand. Because of electrification, EVs, electric vehicles, we are going to start needing less and less oil. So even if the U.S. is not growing production, that's not a problem because oil demand is going to stop growing also and it's going to fall. The other school of thought says, well, actually, oil demand growth is going to prove more sticky than people think. Yes, we are going to start electrifying our vehicles, but you think of all the oil that we use, only about a quarter is gasoline. A lot of the other oil is for things that they cannot be really easily electrified. You struggle to electrify the big trucks that move in diesel. You struggle to electrify all the construction equipment, the petrochemical industry, aviation, et cetera, et cetera. And oil demand may continue growing beyond 2026, 2027, even all the way into the 2030s. And perhaps it stops growing, but it doesn't really fall very, very quickly. That's the second school of thought, and that is the more worrisome one, because that will mean that the U.S. is going to have to go back to Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and OPEC countries. I am more on the second one. I'm a bit worried that the energy transition is not going at the pace that we need, both to fight climate change, but also to avoid high prices later this decade and into the 2030s. And if that comes to pass, Americans who have not had to think about energy security in a long time suddenly might have to. Do you think that that's something that we should all be worried about? I think that we should be worried about because the U.S. has had this kind of wake-up moments all of a sudden politically that they were really unexpected. No one really saw it coming, the oil crisis in the 70s and 80s. And when it came, it really basically became the major subject for some presidencies. I mean, Jimmy Carter presidency was a lot of it about oil prices, gasoline prices, and dealing with the Middle East. It's a problem that we will not be able to solve in the next few years and it's likely to get progressively worse through the rest of this century. We must not be selfish or timid if we hope to have a decent world for our children and our grandchildren. We simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. So uh, the last few presidencies have it easy in some ways because they have not to really worry about oil. I mean, all of a sudden the United States was exporting. It was almost a problem of riches. I mean, Barack Obama, if he could have gone back to the 70s and early 80s and telling Jimmy Carter, oil is not longer a problem. We are actually exporting oil everywhere and helping Europe, etc., etc. And I worry that perhaps come back in five years' time, a president in the White House is going to have to worry again about oil in a major way. And that kind of really tailwind that the shale revolution has been for U.S. economy and U.S. politics is not going to be there. So what is the answer from a policy perspective? If oil production is naturally going down and if electrification and other forms of renewable energy aren't rising quickly enough, is there a policy solution that can bridge that gap? The most obvious one is to reduce gasoline consumption as quickly as you can. So you can do that different ways. You can try to speed up production of electric vehicles, speed up the logistics of electric vehicles, because I think that a lot of people worry about where to charge those electric vehicles. You could tax gasoline and make it more pricey so people use it less. 
But all of those policies have a lot of handicaps. I'm not a politician, but I know that I will not win a single vote if I was running for office just promising to increase taxes on gasoline significantly. So what I will say is, in some ways, politicians have had it a bit easy over the last few years, thanks to shale. That has kept prices lower than otherwise. Doing the energy transition in a situation in which prices are going higher for gasoline and other refined products, it's going to be more difficult because people are going to blame the transition on those prices, even if it's not completely related. And I fear that the public support for the energy transition may wane if prices go up. Javier, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Bergolino. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Michael Falero and Mo Barrow. Rafael M. Seely is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back on Monday with another big take. Have a great weekend.